The only life that we are certain about so far in the entire universe is on planet Earth. Whether that life is intelligent is, let's say, arguable. But anyway, it's not surprising that we're tirelessly searching for life on other planets. So far, they've discovered more than 4,000 of them. But what's even cooler? NASA has compiled a new list of 24 planets that aren't just Earth-like, they're better. The conditions on them are so good that they're more comfortable than on our planet. So let's examine some of them. KOI 5715.01 Hmm, let's be coy, shall we? <laughs> this wonderful planet is in the constellation Cygnus. And why is it so wonderful? Well, our sun is a yellow dwarf. And sorry sun, even though you're not bad at supporting life, there are some stars that can do it better. Nothing personal. The planet Koi 5715.01 orbits near an orange dwarf. Orange dwarfs are stars slightly smaller than our sun and have a little lower luminosity. Uh, did you like the alliteration there? Anyway, don't worry, it doesn't mean we're going to live in complete darkness. In fact, if the planet is found closer to the sun and it has a thicker atmosphere, it may even be lighter and more colorful than on Earth. Now, our sun has a very short lifespan. Right now, it has 7 to 8 billion years left to live, a little longer than Earth's age. But orange dwarfs can live from 45 to 70 billion years. This is great not only because we'll be able to hang out on this planet longer, but also because the planets around these stars have more time to form life. Now, ideally, we would need to find a planet next to an orange dwarf that is about 7 billion years old. It's very likely there will be at least some organisms there. Koi 571501 is about 5.5 billion years old. Yeah, it may not seem mature enough, but that's okay, neither do I. Our Earth is a billion years younger, and that didn't stop us. The planet is quite close to its star and is in a habitable zone. One year there lasts 190 days. Imagine going to elementary school and already getting a driver's license. <laughs> it's almost two times larger than the Earth. The average temperature there is 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is slightly less than ours, 57. But it mostly feels warmer there because strong gravity helps it hold on to heat in the atmosphere longer. It's a little too far away though, like 3,000 light years from Earth, which is about 18 quadrillion miles. Yep, better bring a really big lunch with you. Koi 3010.01 This planet is found next to the star Koi 2010. This planet sounds like a very pleasant world. The average temperature on this planet is 67 degrees, so a little warmer than ours. But that's a good thing. Scientists believe that on a perfect planet, the temperature should be just about 10 degrees hotter than on Earth. The more heat there is on the planet, the more comfortable it is to live there. Also, the higher chances of developing life. The radius of this planet is nearly one and a half times larger than Earth. There's some atmosphere, although we're not yet sure about its composition. But it's probably like the Earth's. Scientists think that we'll find an ocean there, and it can cover up to 60% of the surface, which is also cool. In a perfect world, water and land should be distributed more evenly than on our planet. A little more land means a little more territory and resources, right? But listen, this planet is actually very similar to the Earth. The semblance is so striking that scientists believe we have an 84% chance to find life there. Of course, not necessarily an intelligent life, but at least some animals. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, what do you think they could look like? Hmm, very Earth-like planet, but with stronger gravity. Well, if someone lives there, they're probably big but have a small height and strong little legs. Sounds adorable and scary. But we won't be able to find out the truth anytime soon. So far, for us, these planets are microscopic dots in space. We only have some dry, boring data about them and don't even know what they look like. We'll have to wait until we can find a way to get closer to these planets. Kepler 186f This is also one of the best candidates for having life. This rather cute planet was nicknamed the Earth's cousin because it does have a strong resemblance. Anyway, these two planets are like sisters, not twins. Kepler 186f rotates near a red dwarf. 
Red dwarfs are stars even dimmer and smaller than orange dwarfs. Yeah, they'll also live for a very, very long time, but their luminosity is also quite low. However, Kepler-186f is closer to its star than we're to our sun, so it shouldn't be too dark there. Well, at least not night-like dark. The sky on this planet is sure to be an unusual shade of red, like sunsets on Earth. What do you think? Would you like to live on a planet with an eternal sunset? The size of this planet is about the same as Earth. Not bad, not perfect. Why so? Because the coolest planets are those that are bigger than Earth and have stronger gravity. Now you'll probably say, but wouldn't it be harder to walk there and even harder to get out of bed on Monday? <laughs> of course! But on the other hand, this planet will pull the atmosphere better. The atmosphere will be thicker and denser. This means more protection from the scary space stuff, more oxygen, and more heat. Not to mention the fact that the bigger planets have more space to settle. Awesome, right? But of course, the Earth's size is also an excellent choice. Another cool fact is that the tilt of Kepler-186f is about the same as ours. It means that there should be stable seasons and a normal day-night cycle. Do you know how important the tilt of the planet is? Let's look at Mars. Mars is also, in fact, found in the habitable zone of our Sun. But its tilt is very unstable, and as a result, the entire ocean that could have been on it once now completely dried up. Today, it's just a red desert, and there's no life there. At least not as far as we know. But you see how important these tiny details are? This planet is also quite far away from us, 490 light years. That's about 3 quadrillion miles. So yeah, we're just going to keep waiting for intergalactic travel. Kepler 62e and 62f These planets were called the most Earth-like before we discovered Kepler 186f. They're very comparable to our home. Kepler 62e is about one and a half times larger than Earth, and Kepler 62f is just slightly smaller than that. They're located in the constellation Lyra, which is about 1200 light years away from us. They both also orbit a red dwarf. One year on Kepler 62e lasts about 122 days, even less than on that first planet we talked about. Scientists believe that both 62e and 62f are sort of water worlds. Warm places mostly, or even completely covered with water. If there is land there, it's probably just some islands. Hmm, a world consisting entirely of islands. A fantasy dream for some, think Hawaii, and a nightmare for others, think Megalodon. But if you're a fan of ancient marine animals, just imagine how gigantic they could be there. Still, there are many things we don't know about this planet. Does it have a surface? What about its composition, density? One day, maybe we'll be able to answer these questions. And so, that's it for the super-Earths. Of course, the original list is much longer, and you can go check it out on the internet. Now, the best thing about all this is that these are planets that are better than the Earth. But we also know thousands of other exoplanets that are just close enough to ours. And the odds are, a few of them have at least some form of life. But they're very, very far away, so we have no way to check it out right now. Perhaps, down the road, we'll find some cool creatures on many of them. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Here's a riddle. Which U.S. city is so loved that its name should be repeated twice? You guessed it. New York, New York. But the thing is, how much of New York do we really know? I'm talking about the city that lies under the city. Dare to join me on an underground tour of the Big Apple? Then grab a flashlight. It's about to get dark. We'll start in the heart of Manhattan, in the front of the Romanesque City Hall building. Believe it or not, Beneath our feet lies New York's oldest subway station, known as the Old City Hall Station. It opened in 1904 on October 27th, a night of true celebration for New Yorkers. People were so excited, some of them spent the entire night riding the trains back and forth. Before this, urban dwellers moved around in carriages pulled by horses. No wonder the subway was such a hit! 
You might feel like a time traveler stepping inside the old city hall station. The architecture is dazzling and one of a kind. They sure don't make subway stations like this one anymore. Fun fact, the old city hall station would cost $6.2 million if it was built today. Back in the day, it had dozens of brass chandeliers hanging around. It was one of the few spots in town with functioning electricity. And oh, not to mention brand new multicolored tiled arches and stained glass ceilings you can still see today. Impressive, huh? If you decide to wander down the tracks, you might be in for a treat. Underground New York is as fascinating as the city above the ground. But one thing we usually take for granted is the behind the scenes of what the Big Apple needs to function. Down here, you might see one or two of New York's pneumatic mail tubes. These tubes were built back in the 1800s and they were operational up until the 1950s. They were responsible for distributing people's mail through different post offices. Letters flew at an impressive speed of 35 miles per hour. That's almost as fast as a professional runner. It sure sounds like a useful system. But I have to say, it feels weird imagining people's correspondence flying around 15 feet underground. Back to street level. We'll wander around fancy Lexington and Park Avenues. If you look up, you'll see the famous Waldorf Astoria five-star hotel. Many celebrities have stayed there, including John Lennon and Yoko Ono, as well as presidents such as FDR. This is why the hotel used a secret infrastructure to sneak people inside and out. Under the building, a tunnel known as Track 61 connected the Waldorf Astoria to Grand Central Station. The track was deactivated in the late 70s, but some people say Andy Warhol threw a party there in the 80s. I bet that was something. For the next part of our visit, we'll have to take the subway uptown. We'll get off at 125th Street and find ourselves on the scenic waterfront of Riverside Park. Here, you'll find abandoned tracks of an old metro line. If you follow the tracks, you'll get to an underground graffiti gallery, aka the Freedom Tunnel. The tunnel is named after a graffiti artist from the 80s, who is commonly known as Freedom. While exploring these tunnels, we'll see over 40 graffiti pieces he painted over 15 years. There are spray paints of James Dean, Mona Lisa, and even a self-portrait of Freedom himself. Moving on, let's wander around the northern part of NYC for a bit. Walking in Van Cortlandt Park will feel like hiking upstate, but believe me, you're still in the city. Along the way, you'll encounter some big ventilation towers made of stone. These towers were once part of an old New York infrastructure. They make up the remains of what used to be the Croton Aqueduct. In the 1800s, the city's water supply flowed through a 41-mile-long underground tunnel, all the way from Croton River in upstate New York to Bryant Park in midtown Manhattan. Oh yes, and I should probably tell you that Bryant Park wasn't a park. Instead, it hosted a colossal stone structure that looked pretty much like something ancient Egyptians would build. This four-acre structure served as the city's water reservoir. It even had a pathway on top so that people could enjoy a nice afternoon stroll while looking at the reservoir's crystalline water. Now, all this exploring might have made you hungry, but don't worry, our next stop includes a yummy treat. We'll have to leave Manhattan and make our way to Brooklyn. In case you didn't know, New York City is made of five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. Crown Heights, that's our stop. Would you believe me if I told you that beneath these streets lie caves full of aging cheese? How very Parisian of them. To get down there, you'll have to make your way through a century-old building that now works as an office space. Maybe wave hello to all those hard-working people and disappear in one of the stairways that will take you 30 feet below the ground. You won't need a flashlight for this one. The caves are bright and renovated and can hold up to 22,000 pounds of cheese. But hey, it might stink. That's the main reason cheesemakers decided to use underground tunnels to age cheese in the first place. After a bite or two of some delicious cheese, let's keep going. While still in Brooklyn, you might see tons of locals enjoying a sunny day in the McCarran Park Pool. This pool is a huge attraction, being three times the size of an Olympic pool. As the NYC explorer you are becoming, you might even go for a swim. But hey, there's a much more interesting part to this attraction. 
The pool was built in the early 1900s, but it was shut down in the 50s. During this time, urban explorers discovered a network of underground tunnels right beneath the pool. And, of course, you can find a secret entrance and get a peek for yourself. There, you'll not only see the pool's filtration and heating system, but also a lot of graffiti from the time the site was abandoned. Neat! This question may sound weird, but have you ever seen a cow in New York? I sure haven't. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. Apparently, New York still has underground tunnels that were constructed for the transportation of cattle. Once New York started to flood with automobiles, cows became a burden for traffic. Until a 200-foot-long cow passage was built below 12th Street to transport the livestock that was ferried over from New Jersey. These days, you won't be able to visit this place in person because the tunnel was most likely destroyed. But historians found blueprints proving its existence. To add to the list, archaeologists discovered a very peculiar fossil a while back. Now, imagine peeling off the layers of the city's soil. First, at 15 inches, you'll find a layer of wires. I'm talking TV cables, electricity, and all that. Digging deeper, at 4 feet, you'll see water and sewage pipes. But then, at 15 feet down under the surface of NYC, diggers have found a fossilized shipwreck. The wreck is located right under Broad Street, where there was once shallow water. They believe the wreck dates back to the 1600s. It's 92 feet long and 25 feet wide. Oh, and that's not all. At the intersection of Bowery and Canal Street, engineers stumbled upon a room with its walls and ceiling covered in mirrors. And no one has managed to explain the existence of this bizarre place yet. Our Big Apple underground visit is coming to an end. But we sure did more than just scratch the surface on this one. Before we finish, let's enjoy the best of what NYC cuisine has to offer. A good old bagel. Who knows? Maybe next time we'll do Paris or even London. See you soon, Explorer. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no, its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago though, so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. 
they generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by IceSat happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So, the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. 
The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. You may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer. But when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha ha. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica's ice blanket makes up 70% of the world's freshwater reserves. Imagine what would happen if it melted. The global sea levels would be raised by almost 200 feet. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.